In this video, we'll be discussing intra-AS routing protocols, including the OSPF protocol in particular. Let's get started. Now that we've discussed routing algorithms, we can begin looking at the protocols that put those algorithms to work. In this video, we'll be looking at intra-ISP routing, which is the routing that happens inside of one ISP or enterprise network and is in contrast to inter-ISP routing, which we'll look at in later videos. There are a number of protocols which may be used for intra-domain routing, but the dominant one by far is OSPF. So that's the one that we'll look at as an example in this video. We need to note that scalability is a major concern when dealing with anything on the internet. In our small example so far, the network has been flat, meaning all the routers are roughly equivalent. But in practice in the internet, there are billions of destinations, and it doesn't make sense for every single router that's connected to the internet to know about every single other destination on the internet individually. And we also have the issue that the different entities or networks making up the internet are managed by different organizations, and each of those entities may want to control routing in a different way within their own network. So in order to make routing scalable on the internet, we identify these separately controlled regions as autonomous systems. So one ISP might be an autonomous system, an enterprise customer might have their own autonomous system, a university might be an autonomous system, and each of these is able to control the internals of their own network independently. So we may also think of an autonomous system as somewhat equivalent to a domain. So we may use the terms intra-AS or intra-domain interchangeably. In both cases, we're talking about activities within a network as opposed to activities that happen across network boundaries. Within one domain, the routers need to run the same routing protocol to be able to talk to each other, whereas a neighboring AS may choose to run a different intra-domain routing protocol. And these domains, or ASs, are able to talk to each other at the border by using gateway routers. Inter-domain routing, or inter-AS routing, controls what happens between domains, or ASs. So the gateways use a different routing protocol to communicate amongst each other, and we'll learn more about that in following videos. We often picture the internet as a collection of interconnected autonomous systems, each of which runs their own intra-AS routing that is not concerned with what intra-AS routing is being run by its neighbors. The inter-AS routing protocol, however, is standard, and all the domains must speak BGP to one another. At the gateway router, the forwarding table is a product of both the intra-domain and the inter-domain routing protocols. So for the destinations inside the autonomous system, the intra-AS protocol supplies those, and the inter-AS routing protocol supplies the entries for destinations external to the autonomous system. Here we have a packet arriving at a router inside AS1 that's headed to a destination in another autonomous system. So this router will not know details about destinations in other ASs, but it will have some notion of how to get out of its own AS. So the question is, which gateway should it use? For that question to be answered, the inter-domain routing protocol must learn about which destinations are available through AS2 and which destinations are available through AS3. And then some aggregation of this information needs to be propagated to the other routers inside AS1. As I mentioned, there are a number of options for routing inside of an AS. The most simple of these is RIP, which is a classic distance vector protocol, essentially layering on the bare minimum of control messaging and message headers on top of the basic distance vector algorithm that we talked about in a previous video. RIP is so simple that it's unsuitable for large networks. It suffers from the classic issues that we talked about with distance vector protocols in terms of performance and potential for routing loops and so on. We also have the EIGRP protocol, which was an evolution of the IGRP protocol, which is distance vector based, but it layers a number of enhancements on top and was developed by Cisco. EIGRP has a number of mitigations for the issues found in RIP and so is able to scale to larger networks, but it is still fundamentally distance vector based and comes with the associated limitations. We also have OSPF, which stands for Open Shortest Path First and implements link state routing. OSPF is by far the dominant routing protocol in industry. Some organizations that have been running link state routing for a very long time also use the ISIS protocol, which is functionally very similar to OSPF, but is not supported by as many devices, so it is more common for newer entities to adopt OSPF as a more widely supported alternative to ISIS. Now let's look at a few more details of OSPF. The open part is referring to publicly available. This is a standardized protocol that any router vendor may implement without paying licensing fees. And it implements the classic link state algorithm that we discussed in a previous video. Each router floods link state advertisements, commonly referred to as LSAs, to the rest of the network. 
These are directly on top of the IP protocol and have their own protocol number, so they are not encapsulated inside of a transport layer header. OSPF supports multiple link cost metrics, including the bandwidth of the interface or measured delay on the link. And as we saw with the link state algorithm, each router receives the entire topology through the LSAs and runs Dijkstra's algorithm locally to compute the forwarding table. OSPF supports security by enabling all the messages to be authenticated so that fake OSPF LSAs cannot be injected into the network. In our video about the link state algorithm, we saw that the message complexity is order n squared. And of course, anything that increases exponentially is at odds with scaling to very large numbers. OSPF handles this by enabling a two-level hierarchy. So rather than all of the OSPF routers in an entire autonomous system needing to talk directly to one another through flooded LSAs, they are subdivided into local areas. So each small group of routers exchanges LSAs with each other, but their LSAs do not propagate into the backbone. And so this enables OSPF to scale much more readily than if it was a flat network. So each router in one of the local areas has paths to all the other destinations within that area, and then knows that to get anywhere else, it would send traffic to the area border router, which interconnects this area with the backbone area. Likewise, the backbone knows how to get any traffic to the correct area, and then within the area, the traffic can get to the exact correct router. So in this way, the link state advertisements are only flooded within each individual area. And so the number n in the n squared computation for message complexity is limited to the number of routers in that area or in the backbone, rather than n being the total number of routers in the entire autonomous system. As part of the backbone, we can also have our gateway or boundary routers that communicate with other autonomous systems using the inter-AS routing protocol. The backbone essentially functions in the same way as one of the areas where LSAs are only flooded within the backbone and not propagated to the areas connected to it. That wraps up our discussion of OSPF. In the next video, we'll be looking at inter-ISP routing or inter-AS routing and the BGP protocol. See you then. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you found it to be useful, please click the like button. To be notified when more videos are posted for this class, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell.